uh, first, I, I would like to thank Paul for giving me the opportunity to present my idea here, some thoughts about uh, mapping space time with Lisa. Uh, so the question is very simple. How can we, from the observation, observation of Emory waveform, how can we extract the following stuff? First of all, the space time metric of the central object. Uh, second, uh, the orbital parameters of the small moon. And third, the tidal coupling between these two objects. So these are two assumptions I made. First, I, made, I assume the central body to have a space-time metric, which is a stationary axisymmetric reflection symmetry across the equatorial plane and asymptotically flat. So I will use the SARSAF to denote this kind of space-time. Uh, stationary and uh, asymptotically flat is a reasonable as if, uh, is the reasonable assumptions. Um, if the central body don't have axis symmetry, if it has some bulge or lump, then it will emit strong gravitational waves. In other words, uh, if it don't emit a strong gravitational waves, it must be have a axis symmetric space time. The reflection symmetry is a assumption that I made to make the mathematic mathematics uh, simpler. In principle, we can abandon this reflection symmetry assumption. The second, uh, uh, we assume the dynamics can be described by adiabatic approximation. So the inspiring moon is uh, sufficiently compact uh, and its mass is uh, sufficiently small, such as the radiation reaction time scale is much longer than the orbital time scale. So with this adiabatic approximation, we can divide the observed waveform into several snapshots. Each snapshot uh, is connected uh, with, uh, with the moon move in a single geodesic. When the moon loses uh, a certain amount of energy, it will make a transition to a new geodesic and, uh, uh, and so on. So these are the two assumptions I made. Uh, as is well known, uh, Fitton Ryan proved a theory in 1995 that uh, we, can, uh, we can map the space time with Lisa. He Besides the two assumptions I made, he added two more assumptions. First, he assumed the geodesics are nearly equatorial and nearly circular, so that there are three fundamental frequencies. Uh, the orbital fre frequency omega phi related to the amplitude circular and equatorial motion. And uh, because the, the motion is nearly circular and nearly equatorial, there are two oscillating uh, frequencies uh, Radio, oscillation, radio oscillating frequency and uh, vertical oscillating frequency. Then he, has, he neglected the tidal coupling between the central body and the moon. Uh, so this two plus the two assumptions uh, in the previous slide, uh, he worked out uh, the, this formula. Uh, so in this uh, three formulas, uh, he showed how we can extract uh, the space time metric uh, from if we expand uh, this uh, three frequencies uh, in terms uh, in some post Newtonian manner. Uh, here spin will appear at uh, this order, and the, uh, the quadruple m2 will appear at this order. So, th so with this uh, uh, theory expansion, we can obtain the coefficients, and from the coefficients, uh, we can obtain the space time metric. So, this is what Ryan did in, in his paper. So, my generalization of Ryan's theorem will lie in two aspects. First, I consider generic orbits, uh, generic uh, geodesics uh, and uh, waveform in this uh, space time. Uh, I try to abandon this uh, nearly circular and nearly equatorial assumption. Second, I will try to extract the tidal coupling information between the moon and uh, the central body. So these are the two main um, generations. Um, uh, before doing that, uh, I like to specify the gauge in this problem. So in this space, uh, in this uh, stationary axis symmetric uh, reflection symmetry across the equatorial plane and in asymptotically flat space time, there is a natural choice of a coordinate. We use the so-called Y coordinate, rho, z, phi, and t. And uh, in this coordinate, the metric uh, can be written in the familiar form. Here, f, omega, and gamma are three functions that only depend on rho and z coordinates. They don't depend on phi or t because, uh, because of the two symmetry in this problem. So first, let's consider the geodesics in this space time. Uh, we have three non-constants of motion. 
the energy, the angular momentum, and the norm of the forward velocity if we use the uh, uh, proper time as the affine parameter. So these three constants are, are known. If there, are, there exists a first integral of motion, for example, the Carter constant in curved space time, then the geodesic equation is completely separable. So the geodesic equation uh, uh, can, be, can be solved using the so-called action angle variable theory. Uh, for example, in Goldstein's uh, classical mechanics book, uh, he has uh, chapter chapter ten to describe uh, this uh, uh, system, and uh, the solution to the, this uh, geodesic equation can be written in Fourier series. So rho and z coordinates can be decomposed into different harmonic components. In the exponential function, there are only two fundamental frequencies: lambda rho and lambda z. These two fundamental frequencies. Uh, as for the phi and t coordinates, uh, these two coordinates have some secular growing term. So there must be some linear growing term here to, de to account for this effect. This uh, lambda phi and lambda t uh, account for the linear growing part. And the rest part will be oscillating. So this, uh, the remaining part is the same with the uh, rho and z coordinate. So this is uh, well known and can be proved uh, mathematically uh, rigorously. However, if even with uh, the interesting thing is that uh, even if we don't have the first integral of motion, if we only have uh, this three integral of motion, this uh, there is a mathematical theorem called Kolmogorov uh, uh, Lord and Moss theorem that says uh, this uh, uh, system, the geodesic, can still be written in this manner. In this, uh, uh, if the system is non-integrable, then this equation. Is a co then we call this system to be quasi multiperiodic, not uh, strictly periodic. So in order to understand this uh, theory, uh, I do a simple example. I consider a uh, particle move in an axisymmetric uh, stationary Newtonian potential, which has the same symmetry as uh, our general relativity counterpart. So I choose this uh, potential, which has a quadrupole and octopole, and this P2 and P4 are the Euro lambda functions. So this is the general axisymmetric potential. And I do some numerics uh, to solve this uh, uh, orbit. So here, here is the faster Fourier transformation of the R coordinate. And here, uh, the picture is not clear, but uh, we can see here are m nine main um, harmonic components uh, up to here. If we cut off the higher, cut off the higher frequencies at the at this level, we have nine harmonic components. And this is the frequency domain configuration. If we go back to time domain, this is the integration, this is the whole evolution of uh, the R coordinate. This is quite nasty, and we can't see anything. And if we zoom in, we will see, we, we still don't, don't see anything interesting. But if we zoom in again, if, I, I don't know if you can see here are two curves very close to each other. One is the blue curve, and another is the green one. So, so the idea, the, the main idea is uh, we can use uh, quasi periodicity to describe this uh, numerical solution, which uh, which say, which tells you that uh, even if we only have uh, three constants of motion, not four constant, uh, this uh, system still have uh, very nice property in frequency domain. So this is mathematical description of OKM theory. I think I should skip this. And uh, so the bottom line is, uh, is uh, in this uh, stationary axisymmetric uh, and uh, reflection symmetry across the equatorial plane and asymptotically flat space time, is there most of the orbits are quasi multiperiodic. Uh, however, I should mention there are, they do have uh, some chaotic orbits, uh, but uh, uh, Ilya Mandel, Jonathan Gale, and I, and uh, other people have done a lot of uh, numerical. Um, uh, experiments uh, and uh, we have we found that uh, in this band uh, when the radius is about uh, 8 m or 6 m all the, uh, most of the orbits are quasi periodic uh, or we only when we go to for example r equal 2 m can we find some chaotic orbits so that's uh, out of the question we don't uh, need to worry about this chaos after we understand the geodesic in this space time let's consider the wave generation the general gravitational waves. So in order to calculate the gravitational waves, I use the green function method. So here, 
right? We have these two uh, uh, symmetries in this problem, stationary and active symmetry. With these two symmetry, we can we know the green function must be this, in this form. The phi and t coordinates must be uh, separable and uh, can be written in this manner. They only appear in the exponential function here. This is the green function. What about the source? Uh, the moon perturbed the central body's uh, gravitational field, and uh, which, uh, which in turn will emit gravitational waves. So the source can be expressed uh, using the stress energy tensor for the point particle. After we combine the green function and the source together, we can calculate the gravitational waves. And you only use these two symmetry, we can deduce that the gravitational waves uh, um, can be written in this manner. Uh, in the middle, I skip some algebraic uh, simplification. So the my con conclusion is that uh, in time, uh, if we measure gravitational waves in terms of the coordinate time t, uh, which we, which is the time we measure at infinity, then the uh, then the frequency information is uh, very clear. They have, uh, uh, it, it has uh, three fundamental frequencies, om omega phi, omega rho, and omega z here. So the fre frequency picture is very clear. So given we know the gravitational waves, uh, now we can ask uh, what we can observe. So it's quite uh, obvious. We can observe the amplitude, h, and uh, the phase. From phase, uh, we can deduce these uh, three fundamental frequencies. Uh, these are the, all the quantities we can observe. And uh, if we observe for a long enough time, we can also observe the uh, slow time illusion of these uh, quantities. The, these quantities will change during a radiation right, uh, during a radiation reaction time scale. What can we do from observation? Okay, so if we only use the frequency information, if we only use these three fundamental frequencies. Uh, let's count uh, how many degree of freedom we have in this problem. Assume we have detect uh, n snapshot, uh, then we have uh, three n data, uh, known data, um, the three frequencies uh, are related to each snapshot. Each snapshot has its own orbital parameters. Uh, so in time, we, we have uh, three uh, unknown parameters. Uh. Furthermore, we have uh, infinity number of uh, space time multiple moments. Uh, so it's obvious uh, we have uh, more unknown than the known data. We are we screw up, and uh, it's not not easy to do anything. Then why Ryan succeed? Oops. Ryan give some uh, constraints to the orbit. Ryan assumes the geodesics to be nearly equatorial and uh, nearly circular. So he uh, decreases the number of uh, orbital parameters. Uh, Within each snapshot, uh, he only need to use uh, the radius of that uh, geodesics uh, to to denote that. Uh, uh, orbits, so which, which means we have only un, un unknown um, orbital parameters. Then we have two uh, extra degree of freedom. From that, we can extract the space-time information. It's, ob uh, it's straightforward to generalize the right idea to uh, to another more complicated system. For example, to eccentric uh, equatorial orbits. Assume the geodesic lies in the equatorial plane. Then it's uh, obvious that we can have, we have an actual degree of freedom to uh, extract the space-time information. Uh, I have worked out the analytical expressions for these three frequencies uh, in terms of uh, the semi-lattice spectrum eccentricity, mass, spin, quadruple, and others. And from that, uh, we, from that, combined with the observation, we can do some iteration procedure to uh, obtain the multiple moment. Uh, the iteration is as follows. So the idea is, uh, each time we compare the we compare the estimate uh, the mass we estimate uh, and we collect them together. So as a, as far as, uh, as more and more snapshots we use, uh, the estimate the, the mass will converge. Uh, the estimation of mass will converge to some stable value, and that that value should be the true mass of the central body. And uh, similarly, we can treat it for the higher spin, for example, and uh, the quadruple and uh, and so on. Now we want to ask. Uh, can we go one step further? Can we throw away all, all the, any constraint on the orbit? Can we consider the most generic uh, inclined and eccentric orbit? So this time we need to use the amplitude information uh, because we already know from the degree of freedom argument uh, that we, we must uh, use some more information here. We must use the amplitude information or the time evolution of these three frequencies. 
both of them are required to trade wave generation in this space time. Uh, before this slide, uh, I, base, I do all my argument using only the symmetry in this, uh, 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 only using the symmetry, the axis symmetry and uh, the stationary symmetry. I don't uh, need to worry about the uh, uh, wave generation in this space time. But uh, when we want to consider the most general question, we must uh, cal calculate the wave generation in this space time. We know numerical relativity, of course, can do it. But uh, that's the one thing different from the binary black hole problem when for numerical relativity. We, we must uh, first uh, make, it clear, make it clear what's the inner boundary condition here. OK, so, so to understand uh, the influence of inner boundary condition, uh, I would like to say something about the tidal coupling. The, uh, the, the tidal coupling, uh, uh, experimentalist uh, can measure the can measure the luminosity, the whole luminosity uh, from the waveforms, uh, from which we can divide them to two parts: the part that go to infinity and the, the part that go to the black hole. I, I have to do some estimation. Uh, uh, not not uh, result, My results need to be checked, uh, and uh, the preliminary result shows that uh, this uh, luminosity to infinity is. Uh, insensitive to the inner boundary condition, up to 6.5 pn order. However, this uh, tidal coupling effect uh, will depend on the inner boundary condition at uh, 2.5 pn order. So which means if we measure this part, uh, and if we calculate uh, the, this part, then we can obtain the tidal coupling information. On the other hand, uh, this inner boundary condition will influence the whole luminosity function, which in turn will change the dynamics uh, in this embryo system. So before numerical relativity uh, can solve this uh, system, we must uh, cl clarify what's the appropriate uh, inner boundary condition here. So this is my, this is my conclusion. Uh, I made two assumptions here. The space-time is uh, stationary, axis symmetric, uh, reflectional symmetric across the equatorial plane, and uh, asymptotically flat. And uh, I assume the dynamics uh, can be described uh, by adiabatic uh, approximation. Given these two assumptions, uh, we, what do we know? We know the waveform can be written in this manner. And uh, in, frequency, in frequency domain, the waveform information is uh, quite clear. And uh, we also know we can extract the space-time information and the orbital parameters uh, from these three fundamental frequencies uh, if the orbits uh, are equatorial eccentric. Uh, uh, or similarly, we, if the orbit is circular inclined, we can also extract the tidal coupling information. What we don't know, we don't know if the, f the most generic uh, geodesics, uh, when the geodesics are both uh, eccentric and inclined, we don't, we don't have an analytical way to do it. And the main difficulty lies in two parts. First, the geodesic in, in geodesics in non integrable space time. We have uh, three integrals uh, and uh, four coordinates, uh, so we, we don't have an analytical uh, method to solve this system. We have to use a numerical method. And uh, second, uh, we have to clarif uh, clarify the ambiguity in inner boundary condition. That's all. <laughs>